good evening eric part 2 aspirants our domain for today's class is cardiac aspirants where which would be conducted by dr sankar subhadas now sir you can proceed so hello everyone good evening now this is a i think a big discussion covering cardiovascular system i will try to uh, concentrate on the salient topics uh, that commonly the question comes in edic courses so if you think of cardiovascular system uh, the common uh, entities that we cover is uh, the coronary artery disease atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease uh, next the uh, congenital heart disease uh, valvular heart disease uh, arrhythmias uh, cardiomyopathies hypertrophic dilated restrictive uh, and a few of uh, pericardial disorders so mostly these are the, uh, the salient topics that uh, the questions come in edic mrcp and other standard examinations so starting with the coronary artery disease if you want to ask any question you can let me know or you can interrupt me uh, we will have some uh, small mcqs during our discussion you can also discuss the questions in between the term acute coronary syndrome has been developed to describe a collection of ischemic conditions which begins with unstable angina the non st elevation mi and ultimately to st elevation mi the difference is that if a patient is having a classical cardiac chest pain in the form of a crushing chest pain which is precordial with the radiation along the arms or a choking sensation in the throat or jaw pain or radiation of the pain along the right arm or left arm or radiation to the back with sweating so this is basically what we call as a classical cardiac pain or unstable angina unstable angina means whether the patient is having chest pain or rest or there has been a change in the nature of the pain initially the pain used to subside with sublingual nitrates but now the patient is having a new type of chest pain which is not yet getting relieved with sublingual nitrates so that is what we call unstable angina and when this patient of unstable angina comes to the emergency with persistent chest pain that does not get relieved with sublingual nitrates and the cardiac enzymes in the form of atropinins becomes positive then we call it as a non st elevation mi now the ecg is significant in non st elevation mi the ecg may be normal or there may be ecg changes in the form of t inversions stt changes or st depressions so mostly st depression t inversion stt changes with positive troponins and a classical cardiac pain is a non st elevation mi and then comes st elevation mi or stmi where you know the ecg shows a definite st elevation in the precordial leads either the anterior leads or in the inferior leads or in the lateral leads it has been called that more than 1 mm st elevation if it is the limb leads or more than 2 mm st elevation if it is the precordial leads it should be ideally the contiguous leads which shows st elevation that we call it an st elevation or stmi any patient who develops a new onset left bundle branch block can also have an mi which is equivalent to an st elevation mi or stmi so we have discussed this features now how long does it take for the troponins to become positive now it normally takes standard 3 hours for the troponins to become positive so even if the initial ecg is normal and the patient is having a classical cardiac pain then ideally you should continue to do serial ecgs after half an hour or after one hour to see the progressive ecg changes that should be ideally done in the emergencies so the key stages in the development of acute coronary syndrome the ischemic cascade there is a plaque formation and rupture so that is what happens this is a stable plaque inside the coronary artery 
this is the thin cap fibroatheroma that we call this is the cap and what happens that due to endothelial shear stress shear stress of the blood flow there is sudden rupture of this thin cap fibroatheroma and there is collection of platelet plug followed by thrombin formation so either there could be, there would be a subtotal or there could be a total occlusion of the coronary arteries that leads to either a non ST elevation MI or a STEMI. Ischemic coronary arteries. I mean, the stable is the first presentation is basically a diastolic dysfunction. Remember, diastolic dysfunction is the earliest feature of ischemic heart disease. This is basically a symptom of inside the heart and it develops systolic dysfunction. At the same time, the patient develops ECG changes as well and subsequently. Secondly, it could be unstable angina, unstable angina, STEMI or MI. Now, here is a scenario. I will not say you that this is a classical MI scenario, but you need to go through this picture and say me that what is the most possible probability answer. 28-year-old man presents with central chest pain, which increases on inspiration and is relieved on bending forwards. He had a flu-like illness few days back, having intermittent fever with palpitation. His BP 130, 70 pulse, 90 hemoglobin fine, WBC 10,000, a bit high, platelets fine, sodium potassium creatinine okay, troponins 0 0.09. Which of the following is the most likely ECG finding for this patient? A convex ST elevation in anterior leads, TR prolongation, QT prolongation, Saddle shaped ST elevation present in most leads, P wave inversion in inferior leads. I think it's four. four. Saddle shaped ST shepherd. elevation present in most yeah. leads. Four. Saddle shaped ST elevation. Very good. So, what do you think? What is the most likely diagnosis? Pericarditis. 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 Viral, so, it is viral. most likely an acute viral. pericarditis. Someone said constrictive, so it is not a constrictive pericarditis. It is oh. most likely an uh, acute pericarditis that has developed. Oh, so sure. This patient is having a typical chest pain that gets relieved on bending forwards, that it teases on inspiration. So this is very classical, you know, and pericardial pain does not happen in classical ischemic pain. So you get ST elevation in most of the leads. Except you get ST depression. Do you know in which leads show the ST depression? AVR. AVR. The only lead that shows ST depression is AVR. And also there is a PR segment depression in pericarditis. That is also a feature of pericarditis. PR segment depression. So what are maybe the causes of pericarditis? Anyone? It may be viral pericarditis. Viral and viral tubercular <laughs> tubercular pericarditis, bacterial. So then trauma. Infect huh, infective. Traumatic. Post viral, post bacterial. Post Is these are all post tubercular? Yes. yes. Post traumatic. Yes. Yeah. Post traumatic. Yeah, post -traumatic. There may metabolic any like uremic. Any other possibility? There may yeah. be metabolic. Like yes, metabolic. Then, uremic, then connective tissue disorders. They can present with uh, as part of very common disease, polycerositis. Like yes. And one, well, which one is the most? We, you have not yet told me the most significant cause. What is that? Post myocardial infarction. Post myocardial also infarction. Yes. Yes. yes, that is most important. That is the commonest scenario that we see. A yes, patient post uh, he is he was having initially an ischemic chest pain, and later on he develops a pain that is very classical of pericardial pain. That is, he complains of a pain which is related with inspiration, coughing, sneezing, and the pain gets relieved with uh, classical pain paracetamol or other anesthetic. So this is the clinical feature. Just the classical ischemic chest pain. Uh, you, you may be asked on what is the classical nature of ischemic chest pain. You have to remember that it extends from the jaw above 
and below up to the umbilicus. So this is the zone of radiation of cardiac pain. It could be a left arm tingling sensation. It could be a classical jaw pain. It could be something sticking in the throat. It could be classical heaviness. It could be a band-like sensation. It could be a simple radiation to the back. So all this comes under the spectrum of classical ischemic chest pain. And one of the most common disorder that is confused with ischemic chest pain is diffuse esophageal spasm. This is also an entity which is very commonly confused with cardiac pain. Now, you know the initial investigations, ECG, uh, cardiac markers, that is proponins and cardiac enzymes, and you do an echocardiogram. Now, in ECG, you know the lead changes, you know the leads and anterior volume I or inferior volume I. Can, you, can any one of you tell me what is the ECG finding in posterior volume I? What is the ECG finding in posterior volume I? Yes? Anyone? ST mirror dominant, changes. Dominant yeah. heart wave in V1, V2. ST depression. ST depression in uh, uh, precordial is V1, V2, V3. Yes. With dominant R waves. So that is the very classical feature of posterior volume. I. It signifies that either the offending artery is left circumflex or it could be a posterior descending artery, which is a branch of uh, right coronary artery. So that is a classical feature of posterior volume I. In lateral volume I, you get ECG changes in lead wall, AVL, V5, and V6. Yes. And if it is an inferior volume I, then can you make out which is the offending artery, whether it is right coronary artery or whether it is left circumflex? Anyone with the ECG? Uh, if there is block, if yeah. there is any block, yeah. Yeah. proximal. Uh, if there is any block along with the inferior wall MI, then we think about the proximal involvement mm -hmm. of the right coronary artery. And mm -hmm. uh, in the majority of the patient, like 60% patient, it is the RCA which uh, supplies no, the... No, no. I mean, really, I'm telling you, just think it's simple in, a, or in the left circumflex artery. Clear. Now you will get ST elevation in lead 2, 3 and AVF. Now, you look at the extent of ST elevation in lead 2 and lead 3. If the lead 2 elevation is more than lead 3, then it is a left circumflex occlusion. And if the lead 3 elevation is more than lead 2, then it is a right coronary artery occlusion. And if we get a right coronary artery occlusion, then we also take a right side the chest lead, especially V4R and V3R, to see whether there is any RV involved. So that is plain and simple. You see the extent of ST elevation in lead two and lead three, and accordingly you decide. Similarly, in anterior volume I, if the ST elevation begins from V2 instead of V1, so the V1 is paired and the ST elevation begins from V2, then most likely the height of occlusion of LED is distal to the origin of first septal. Or if there is yeah, ST elevation in the precordial leads along with this elevation in lead 1, AVL, V5, V6. So that means there is also lateral wall involvement. So the site of occlusion of the LED is proximal to the diagonal. Or if V5, V6 is squared, then the site of occlusion of LED is distal to the diagonal. So these are, these are simple ways by which you can have an idea that what may be the site of occlusion in LED or RCA. No it's sir, because your voice was broken in the beginning. Okay. Do you want me to repeat? Yeah, like distal or proximal, you said, no? Because I, what I know, if there is anterior wall MI along with the block, then we say proximal part of the left coronary, like left uh -huh. main. Uh -huh. But what you said, it was nice. Like, please, can you repeat again? No, I'm telling you, first of all, about inferior volume I. In inferior volume I, you get ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, if you get ST elevation in lead 2, which is more than lead 3, then it is... Left circumflex. Left circumflex, yes. 
Yes. And if the elevation in lead 3 is more than lead 2, then yeah. it is an occlusion yeah. of right coronary artery. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, anterior now, also... If you, if you have a suspicion of a right coronary artery occlusion, then you should ideally also see whether there is RV involvement. So, if you have okay. a suspicion of RV involvement, say the patient is having hypotension, significant. In that case, you can take an ECG of the right-sided leads and you look at V3R and V4R. V4R is very specific. So, if there is an S elevation in V4, right-sided V4, then it signifies that this patient is also having involvement of the RV. Okay. This patient also has an RV infarct. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you look at the anterior wall MI, where the ST elevation is limited from V1, V2, V3, V4, that is the classical mm -hmm. anterior wall MI. If V1 is paired, say the ST elevation begins from V2, V1 is paired, that mm -hmm. signifies that the site of occlusion of LAD is distal to the origin of first septal. Is that clear? Origin of? First septal, the, what are the branches of LED? LED uh, has the septal and the diagonals. Okay, okay, sure, sure. So the first septal and the first diagonal. If you want to make out what is the site of occlusion of the LED, whether it is proximal to the septal or distal to the septal, you can okay. make it out by V1, V2 involvement. If V1 is paired, then yes. the occlusion is distal to the septal. If V1 is involved, then the occlusion is proximal to the septal. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, thank you. And if it is a left main occlusion, then can you tell me what is the ECG finding? Left main occlusion. Left main occlusion, I think we get the blocks also, no? Left bundle. Okay. Elevation in AVR. Anyone else? Can you please repeat the findings of left main occlusion? Yeah. So, ST elevation in AVR. We diffuse okay. ST depression in the precordial leads. So, ST depression from V1 to V6 with ST elevation in AVR, that signifies it is a left main occlusion. Besides okay. sinus bradycardia, significant bradycardia is also one of the features of left main occlusion that also involves in inferior wall MI as well. A new onset left bundle branch block, which was not present before, that is also an indicator of an ST elevation MI, remember a new onset left bundle branch block. Even a new onset right bundle branch block in the background of anterior wall MI is also prognostically bad. A new onset right bundle branch block in a background of anterior wall MI is also prognostically bad. So these are the various biomarkers, the cardiac markers that we see, the troponin I, the CKMB, lactate as normally we see proponins and the creatinine kinase. Now, the basic difference between the proponins and the creatinine kinase is that the troponins get elevated early within three to six hours, but they get normalized within seven to ten days. They take a long time to get normalized. The CKMB normally gets elevated within six to twelve hours, but they normalize early by 72 hours. So if you want to know about recurrent MI, whether the patient again had an MI, in that case, a CKMB will be a better tool compared to troponins because troponin remains elevated for a long time. By troponins, you can't know whether this patient is having a recurrent MI. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. okay. So this is one more question for you. A 40-year-old CKD patient has landed up with uncontrolled hypertension. ECG revealed a significant left ventricular hypertrophy with an audible fourth heart sound. Now, the fourth heart sound corresponds to which segment of ECG? After the P wave, after the T wave, before the P wave, after the QRS complex, before the T wave. Fourth heart sound. Does it happen during systole or does it happen during diastole? This is my basic question to all my students. 
when does fourth heart sound happen? Is it a systolic sound or it is a diastolic sound? Late diastole. Very good. It is a late diastolic sound. So it will happen just before S1. It will happen just before S1. So it is a pre-systolic gallop or that we call it. It happens in late diastole. Now look at the ECG. The systole begins from the QRS complex. As the systole contracts means the QRS complex, beginning of the QRS. Two, the beginning of the T wave is the systole. And the diastole is from the T to the next QRS. So what is the cause of this? Uh, what is the cause of fourth heart sound? Can anyone tell me? Is, no did is Steve, is Steve left ventricle? Yes, but what is the cause, physiology of fourth heart sound? Why it happens? Do you know the phases of diastole? Can you recap yeah. your physiology knowledge? Can you recap your physiology? In LVH, uh, before the atrial contraction, forceful yeah. contraction. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So there are three phases in diastole. The early diastolic rapid feeling phase, then the diastasis and the terminal atrial contraction phase. So that is the phase when the atrium contracts to eject the blood into the ventricle. And this contraction produces the fourth heart sound. And atrial contraction is basically the cause of P wave. So the fourth heart sound will happen after the P wave. The answer, the fourth heart sound corresponds to after the P wave.